Well, we continue our studies tonight in growth to full stature. And Lord willing, for this time, this will be the last study in this series, for now at least. And tonight our message is centered around the theme, the final touches to our growth to full stature. The final touches to our growth to full stature. I have for that Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. And there, if you want to turn, you can. There is a familiar passage where husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And that he is in the process, by the washing of the word, removing every spot and wrinkle and blemish from his church. So the final touches in our growth to full stature. Now in this passage in Ephesians 5, you can see that we are informed that Christ is now in the process of cleansing his body, the church, by the power of the word, the washing of the word. Now that's very important as well as significant that that's the way he does it. He cleanses us with his word in preparation to receiving the church unto himself. Now, contrary to the popular notion, and that notion is that God's basic purpose is to save sinners by giving them a quick John 3.16 wash and then hang them out to dry in some church pew somewhere to wait for the rapture. Contrary to that, we see here in this passage that Christ's purpose is to remove every last spot and wrinkle and blemish by the washing of the word. He doesn't intend to give us any quick two dollar and a half wash job like you get in the car washes where they leave mud on the wheels, bugs on the windshield, and big dirty spots all over the car that the brushes never touch, and the people who wipe your car never seem to see them either. You do that when you get home. No, he doesn't intend to give us a quick wash job, John 3.16, wash, but his purpose, as we see here, is to wash us thoroughly by the word. By the way, how can he do it if it isn't taught? And where is it taught? Well, a few places, praise God. So he intends to remove every spot and wrinkle and blemish from us. That is, if we will submit to the washing. It isn't pleasant always, but necessary. To these who submit, he's in the process of putting the finishing touches on us. Now, some of you may think, finishing touches? What is all of that I've been experiencing all of these past years? The trials and the tests and the chastenings and the hours of discipline studying the Word of God and prayers and fastings and persecutions and slander and ridicule? I thought that was my crucifixion. What is this finishing touches? You mean there's more? Yes, you remember in the crucifixion accounts in the Gospels, after they'd suffered a long time, then they came and broke their legs. (laughs) Thrust the spear in the side. Finishing touches. That's what is getting ready to happen to us. The legs will be broken. The spear thrust. But cheer up. The application of finishing touches means there isn't as much suffering as there has been, that you're getting closer to the end, the preparation for the manifestation. Oh yes, after crucifixion, and that's painful and lasts a long time, comes the breaking of the legs and the spear thrust in the side. And so God's purpose in removing the blemishes and the spots and the wrinkles by his word from our lives is... Because if he leaves those there, then those spots and wrinkles and blemishes will mar our spiritual complexion, blemish our Christian character, spot and wrinkle those garments of righteousness that he shed his blood to give us. And so God intends to do a thorough job with the washing of the word for those who will submit to it. It's like cutting down a tree. You know, you cut off the branches and the limbs first and then parts of the tree, and you finally level it to the ground, but very few people ever dig up roots. And sometimes, because the roots are there, the next spring they will put forth a shoot. 
And that old tree that you thought was dead is very much alive. We paid to have cut down 13 catalpa trees out of our yard. Now, if you don't know what a catalpa tree is, it's good for absolutely nothing. Big elephant ear leaves and those cigars, we used to call them cigars, they get in your gutters and stop them up when they fall off the trees. And the wood, you can't burn it. It's no good for anything. And yet about... Well, several of them, anyway, I started to say half, but several of them, every spring they put forth new shoots. And if you'd leave them alone, you'd have catalpa trees again. Now, why do they put forth shoots? It's because the roots are still alive. And so God intends to do a thorough job, work, washing in our lives and remove the roots, not just cut down the tree by our crucifixion, but the breaking of the legs and the spear thrusts, the finishing touches, is the removal of the roots, if we'll submit to it. And he's going to do that by his word. Remember Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Now, I think if we point out to you some of the roots that may still be lingering in your life, you know, you thought you were pretty dead, but remember the roots are still there. If we point some out as examples, as typical, I think you'll be able to understand why God must do a finishing work in us. And I think you would be the first if you want to go to the deeper life and all the way with the Lord and overcome. I think when you see some of the roots that are still there, you'd be the first to admit that the ax ought to be put to the roots. And you could make up a list if you were teaching, and you could probably think some others, but we'd be here till 1999, pointing out all the roots that are possible. So I'll just deal with some that are typical. First of all, I want to deal with one that is called a root, an evil root, and that's 1 Timothy 6.10. And God wants to root out things in our lives, and these are just typical. 1 Timothy 6.10, and that's the evil root of a love of possessions. You may think you're dead to that until we discuss some things, and maybe you'll see that you're not completely dead yet. But Paul says in 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money, we could substitute possessions, things. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's not the money, it's not the possessions, it's the love, the affection for it. Which, while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You know, I was thinking tonight as I was studying for the teaching session how that, that verse so typifies so much of the ministry today that are always expressing a love of money. You know, money, money, money is central. If they would just trust God, they wouldn't have to beg for money, for God would supply it. But these phrases here, the love of money is the root of all evil. There he uses the term root, which while some coveted after, and that's what they're doing. They have erred from the faith. They certainly have. I'm talking about ministries always begging for money. And they've pierced themselves through with many sorrows because of their love of money. Now, many people, and maybe most, if they were honest and just took the spade and began to dig in the soil of their heart, would find that this evil root has buried itself deeply. A lot of people start the faith walk and talk about walking by faith and trusting God for finances, but... Sometimes if the prosperous life, the abundant life doesn't begin soon enough, they begin to wonder if it really works for everybody and not just ministers. After all, they don't have 2,000 people to put an offering in a box, even if they don't take an offering. And so all of those questions. People who will endure a trial of sickness without any thought of ever wavering. People who will rejoice in persecution for the word's sake, even the faith word's sake. People who would never think of submitting to some fleshly temptation, yet find when they begin to go through a trial or dig into the soil of their heart, they find their possessions are really possessing them that they could not really go back to where they were. You may have the house paid for now and be driving a big car, money in the bank. Well, what if you had to go back to where you had the bicycle or VW or whatever it is you drove? I drove an old 59 Dodge, and it wasn't 59. <laughs> it was way up in some other year when I was driving that. 
But could you go back to that and say that I absolutely have no affections for material things, possessions, the home, the car, whatever. Could you go back to where you were 10 years ago, 20? If God required it as a test? Now you have to think about that a while because it's taking you a long time to get where you are through the faith message in this church. Could you go back? I believe I could. I know I could. Because the same God who supplies abundantly now, he never let me go hungry then when I was living a day at a time, an hour at a time, by faith. Still am, but there is a difference in some respects. But some find a financial trial, loss of a job, and so on, a greater trial of their faith than crossing the Red Sea would be, or walking on water, or facing Goliath. You know what that is? Those are the roots of money spirits that still is in the life. Some people have spirits of stinginess. Those roots over the years get buried deeply into the soil of the heart. You have to be careful because the faith message does work for finances that you don't use your faith or allow your faith to turn your affections from total affections from Jesus Christ to things, to possessions. And you know the message of the abundant life that the Bible teaches and we teach. There's no sin in having these things. God promises the things to those who will put him first, to those who have no affection for these things. But I'm saying a good test of whether or not you are really delivered from the root of all evil, that is the love of money, of possessions of things, the real test of whether or not you've been delivered, could you give it up today, this night, if the authorities just took it all and you had to start out tomorrow, you didn't even have the car or roller skates or a bicycle, had to start trusting the Lord all over from scratch for food, shelter, whatever. Now, friends, that's the way we grew up in faith in our household. So I know the way that some have come. They've jumped into the faith message and they've gone almost into the abundant life right away. So they know nothing of trusting God a meal at a time or not having a nickel for a pack of chewing gum. Of course, as I say, that dates you, but not having 50 cents for a pack of chewing gum. <laughs> you see, I know that I could walk that same route again because I'm still walking it, by the way. But God is just supplying abundantly. But the test of whether or not that root is still alive, that root of all evil, the love of things, the love of possessions, is whether or not you could give it up if they took it tomorrow that you wouldn't care. You just praise the Lord because you know he wouldn't let you starve, that he would provide for you. So they're money spirits, these roots which have buried themselves deeply into the soil of the heart. Some people find they can't do anything but sow sparingly. You know in Second Corinthians 9, Paul says you can sow sparingly or sow bountifully. They find it's all they can do is sow sparingly, not bountifully. That is, if God wants a cheerful giver when they give. In financial matters, you'll find that most people will always put their own interests first and the Lord's second. Now, we don't ask for money. We don't take offerings and all of that. But in your own heart, if you have to make a choice between the Lord's offering and your own desires or needs or whatever, what goes first in your thoughts? You know as well as I do that most people put their own interests first. I gave you the example some time back of the man down to two silver dollars and walking with his wife on the way to church. He said, this is the Lord's offering, this dollar. Here's our lunch. That's all we've got shaking them up, walking along, dropped one, rolled out of his hand, down the gutter into the sewer. Oh, he said, oh my, there went the Lord's offering. <laughs> so that's the way it is, friends. And right down to death's door, if people are bound with possessive spirits, if their possessions possess them, that spirit will follow them right down to their deathbed. There are stories and incidents that we could cite that would prove that. Like one man, well-known figure, we'll just say he was in the entertainment business without being more specific, was on his deathbed and was in a coma. And they say that his business manager was there. 
They were gathered around the deathbed, and he came out of the coma, saw his business manager, and began to ask him about the previous day's receipts, gate receipts. And he got a good report, and he lay down and died. In other words, right on his deathbed, that was his only concern about the gate receipts, even though he couldn't spend them. And so if you have those money spirits, they'll follow you right to your deathbed. I read a rather humorous story, if you'll permit, tell it anyway. <laughs> but it illustrates the point. I nearly fell off the chair, so you can do what you want. <laughs> but an old businessman from a foreign country had a little store and an apartment above it. The one I just told you is true. This illustrates the point the same way. And he was on his deathbed in the apartment above the little store that he'd opened at 6 and kept open till 10 every night, seven days a week. And so he said, Mama, yes, Papa, is Reuben here? Reuben is here, Papa. He was almost blind. He couldn't see. He was just gasping, you know, these last few minutes. Mama, is Miriam here? Yes, Papa, Miriam's here. Mama, is Jacob here? Jacob is here. Are the grandchildren here, Mama? The grandchildren are here, Papa. They're all here. We're all here, Papa. He said, if you're all here, then who's downstairs minding the store? <laughs> the last thought you'll have is your pocketbook. There's a little more to it. Reuben. Yes, Papa. Go mind the store. You can watch your Papa die any time. <laughs> But you lose a customer, you lost a dollar. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> Are you allowing, the point is, God to put the finishing touches to this root of all evil in your life? I mean, you have to be honest with yourself. Well, you know, back to the other over and over again, you'll read about or hear about people who are dying and their last thoughts. They'll gather their children around and talk about the will and who gets what in the property. I'm saying those money spirits will follow you. But people who otherwise would be good Christians sometimes let this interfere. I remember talking to a brother one time, and in talking to him, we got into ethics somehow and how... So many people are prejudiced against minorities, whatever, minority. And in the conversation, I could tell that he was prejudiced against minorities, and I, in fact, told him so, that that wasn't a Christian attitude. Well, I said, I'm not prejudiced. I love everyone. And we happened to be talking about the Negro race, and he said, I had a Negro working for me once, and I let him eat lunch with me. That's in the days they carried their lunches to the factory. Why well, let him eat lunch with me? I said, you let him eat lunch with you, and you're not prejudiced. Why, well, in the very tonation, in the very statement you made. I said, would you let a colored person live next door to you? He said, no. <laughs> I said, how about a Chinaman? No. Japanese? No. And you could go down all the minorities? No. I said, why not? He said, because it would depreciate my property values. <laughs> so there you are. And yet, People like that profess to be Christians, and yet it's that almighty dollar they're thinking about. Or like one salesman who rejected our teachings on Christian ethics concerning honesty and being ethical in your business dealings. He was a salesman. Well, I said, I couldn't follow that. If I were totally honest, I would go out of business. I'd go broke. You have to be dishonest to make a living. That's what he said. So is that root of all evil? That's a root God wants to remove. Now, only you know that. You'll have to answer it for yourself. You can be covetous about possessions if you don't have any. I mean, you can be just as guilty of having possessions possess you if you wear an old tattered suit and shoes with holes in it and don't have a dime to your name. Well, let's look at another root of evil. Number two tonight, the remnant of the untamed tongue. Are those roots carryovers from the old life? The remnant of an untamed tongue. Now here, of course, we have James chapter 3, especially verses 5 to 9. If the tongue isn't controlled, then shoots will sprout up 
in the form of criticism, gossip, murmuring, complaining, whatever. We'll look at those two types of sprouts that I mentioned. First of all, criticism and gossip. And here we see the habit of blaming others for all of our problems, home, church, work, life, wherever. It's simply an attempt to avoid the admission that a lot of our problems, a lot of problems in the world, are due to the untamed tongue. And if churchgoers would just learn this, most of the problems would evaporate. Criticism and gossip it would cease, and I'm talking about this church, any church. I'm being conservative to say 90%, actually it's closer to 98%, I'm sure, 90% or more of all the trouble I've had in all the pastorates, and that includes this church, has been because of people not controlling their tongues. Criticism, gossip, errors, whatever it is. Now, although gossip contains criticism, yet gossips generally gossip because they love to talk about things, whether it's true or not. But gossip often contains criticism. As an example, a person will ask, the gossip will say, did you hear what sister so-and-so did? Now, that's the gossip. Then the criticism is, well, I never did have any confidence in her anyway. Yet even though gossip contains criticism generally, they're not gossiping just to criticize, but gossips love to talk about what they've seen or heard or think they've seen or heard. Whether or not it's true or not doesn't matter. Whether or not it hurts others or not doesn't matter. Did you hear what happened to Jane Doe? The Christian sister replies, well, I really don't want to hear because the Bible says to speak only that which edifies. Bring a good report. Well, the gossip says, I believe in speaking only good about others. Pause. And boy, is this good. <laughs> also, remember Jesus' words in Matthew 7. Criticism implies that we are perfect. Oh, if we just remember that, whether you're talking about your wife or your husband or parents or whoever. Jesus said in Matthew 7 that Criticism of others, you know, you've got a beam in your eye and somebody's got a little splinter in theirs. He says, criticism implies you're perfect. Criticism and gossip stems really from contempt and scorn of others. When they fail, when they fall, when they don't measure up to your standards. But Jesus says here, with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. I'm talking to all of us. Those are not just words to memorize and recite in a Sunday school class somewhere. With whatever judgment we judge, God will judge us on the same basis. Those are solemn words. God help me to know when to be silent. And I found in all of my pastorates, eventually gossip and criticism gets back to the leadership. You know, you think you're telling something in secret. It generally gets back to the leadership and reflects on you. Then there's murmuring and complaining. We're talking about two types of the untamed tongue, the remnant of the untamed tongue that God wants to root out. Now, the two most common places that this sin of the untamed tongue is seen is against home and heaven. Murmuring and complaining against home and heaven. Husbands and wives will complain about and to one another. Children will murmur against their parents. Church members against the Heavenly Father. Wives who would never think of being unfaithful to their husbands. Some of them drive their husbands to drink because of their acid tongue. Well, that's a common fact that sociologists, psychologists, and ministers know. Husbands go to drink and other things because of the acid tongue of wives. But husbands who say they're willing to die for the faith once delivered to the saints drive some of their wives to tears with their complaints. And children who have the voices of angels in church will whine like a little puppy dog if they don't get their way or have to do something around the house to, you know, help out. God has ways of curing us, of murmuring and complaining. Now, it can be serious because in 1 Corinthians 10, God says, look at what happened to Israel, and it's going to happen to you, church, or you, church member, 
the same thing, I judged them, I destroyed them, if you murmur and complain against heaven. But what about at home? Well, God doesn't like murmuring and complaining in the home or against heaven. And he has ways of curing. Sometimes he uses a wife or husband to do that. I read of a case where God cured one husband of always complaining about his wife's cooking. It was never cooked to suit him. And he would come home and whatever was boiling or cooking on the stove, he'd grab the spoons and start tasting. You need to add salt to that. How many times have I told you put salt in the bean soup? Or that's too thick, add a little water. Or you know I don't like that, so why are you cooking that? So one day he rushed in and there was a pot boiling on the stove and he grabbed a spoon and took a big swallow of what was cooking there and he said, oh, yuck, do you call that soup? She said, no, I call that dishwater. I'm boiling out a dirty pot on the stove. <laughs> so God has ways of curing complainers. But worse than that is murmuring and complaining against heaven by people who claim to be Christian. I've never understood that one. Obviously, they have no fear of God in their lives, not the God of this Bible, because if they did, they'd put their hand over their mouth before they would ever speak against heaven. They have no fear of the God of this Bible. They must be worshiping some other God. But we hear of such things. Well, I cited 1 Corinthians 10, remember that where God says, you murmur against me, I'll do to you what I did to Israel. But I heard a radio psycho having a psychologist, a radio psycho, so why should I say the whole word since they shouldn't be in the business anyway? But he had a bunch of women on there complaining, you know, about their trials and all of that, and he was supposed to solve them. Here's what one said, one woman guessed, well, I got angry with God. Of course, they shake their fist at heaven and all claim to be Christian. I got angry with God when he allowed a divorce to come in our marriage. God allowed it. Why did he say in Romans 8.28 that all things work together for good? I thought that meant that when you were saved that everything turned out good. No trials, you know. So the psycho replied, your heavenly father understood your anger and your complaint. If he spoke to you now, he would say to you that you are his little girl and he understands that little girls get angry sometimes. My wife, when she heard that, she said, you know, the only difference between a secular psychologist and a religious psycho is the religious psycho sometimes will use the name of God. And I said, yes, and they're angry with him. Well, murmuring and complaining. Shall we move on to another remnant? The remnants of self-love, the roots of self-love that God wants to root out in this age when religionists of all people are trying to promote love of self. So he's finding there are very few people willing to submit to this rooting out of the life that which displeases him. You see, you can't love yourself and love God because people who love themselves love themselves totally. And he said, you have to love me totally. Love the Lord your God with all of your soul, heart, mind. But you hear professing Christians and read their writings who are speaking of self-love and self-esteem as if these are goals that the Christian should be striving after. You hear it all the time, religious broadcasts, in the magazines, from the pulpits, the books, religious bookstores. You'll find shelves full of books on self-esteem, how to develop self-esteem and self-love. Here's another woman on a religious psycho program. She said, it took my divorce to awaken me to myself, how important I was, and make me properly to be able to love myself. And of course, he approves of that because religious psychologists are the ones who promote the idea of teach your children to love themselves. Here's another who was writing a book to liberate Christian women, a Christian women's lib, if you please. One of the things she suggests, you ladies keep your family name, you know, if you're family name is Brown and you married a Smith, then it's Jane Brown Smith. Keep your family name, not just Jane Smith. Secondly, she said, have others call you by your first name, not Mrs. Smith, but Jane. And that way, she said, it will help you keep your personal identity and helps develop self-esteem and self-love. Now, all of these are professing Christians. Here's a man that used to follow the faith message. He wrote an article and said, there's so much emphasis today on the crucifixion of self 
There's no more room for the love of self. And he was sad about it. Well, obviously, such people have never read, or at least they're not taking seriously, what Jesus had to say about hating yourself, hate and forsake, Luke 14, Luke 9, they better read that one too. Or Paul in Galatians 2.20, where he said we are to be crucified with Christ. And then Christ in other passages, like Matthew 16.24, if you follow after me, you have to deny self. Now, you can't love self and deny it. You can't deny it and love it. Deny self, take up the cross, and follow me. Now, the love of self is more than anything else going to hinder your growth to full stature. The love of self. It hinders spiritual growth. Because no one is going to crucify the one he loves the most, self. No one is going to allow the one he loves most, self, to be slandered and persecuted. Self will defend itself. But God will never be able to put the finishing touches on your life as long as old self is still on the throne, strutting around like a peacock, demanding its rights, looking in the mirror and saying, I love you. Can you imagine that? You're taught to do that. Look in the mirror. Look yourself right in the eyes. I don't know what you'll see <laughs> if you follow that advice. You might be surprised when I look back at you <laughs> out of the eyes. That old spirit of self-love just may manifest and you'll see it. But anyway, can you imagine that? I hope you've never been guilty of that without being taught. I've heard of many in this generation looking in the mirror and saying, who am I? You know, they're searching for their identity. But it's another thing to look in the mirror and say, I love you. You see, people who love themselves love themselves totally. There's no room for love of God, love for others. And certainly there wouldn't be any room left for the love of one's enemies. And we're told, you know, to love all of those categories. You'll find people who say they love people they don't even like. Oh, I love everybody, and yet they won't even speak to this person. Or they criticize that minister or that person. They say, I love everybody. Recently, I heard a woman. She said that to me. Oh, I don't have any trouble loving anyone. And then spent, I guess, the next several minutes criticizing people she didn't like. And didn't even see her own inconsistency. In fact, when she said, I just love everybody. Oh, it's easier for me to love people. I said, do you have any problem with humility? But anyway, she didn't get it, and it didn't matter. But friends, if you don't like a person, you can't love them. Now you think about that for a moment. How many people could you put on a list right now you don't like? I hope none. And yet you say, as a Christian, I love everyone. I love even my enemies. Do you like them? <laughs> like the little boy, second grade, that was attracted to the pretty little girl over in the next row and jotted down a note to her, Dear Mary, I like you. Do you like me? John. She scribbled a note on the bottom of his note. Dear John, no, I do not like you. Love, Mary. <laughs> no, you can't love people you don't like. Well, a rather simple example, but dear friends, does it fit you? How many people would you have to answer the note back if they ask you, No, I don't like you. Love, George. Love, Mary. People throw that word term love around, well, like they throw faith around. They don't even know what it means. It's not easy to like some people. How could you love them? So maybe, maybe we ought to start liking people first, and then we can love them. So do you have that root of self-love? Here's another remnant that God wants to root out. He is doubt, fear, anxiety, worry. These are familiar terms to us, but we hope we're looking at them from the other side of the fence. But worry, fear, anxiety, doubt. Basically all of them stem from fear, fear of accidents, sickness, loss of finances, fear of death. Fear of what people will think or say. Are any of these remnants still in your heart, in your life? 
I found that people will worry over anything, even if there's no basis or cause. Some time ago, I used an example of this on the radio, how people will worry when there's absolutely nothing to worry about, like the farmer who bought the farm, two windmills on it. He didn't have anything to worry about, but he went over and took his saw and cut one down. What was he worrying about? He was worried whether or not there'd be enough wind for two windmills. <laughs> people who worry, now you may think that's far-fetched, but you probably got somebody in your neighborhood that's just that big a worrier. If they don't have anything to worry about, they invent things to worry about, is my point. Financial worries. Due to inflation, we've dealt with this before, Christians, just like non-Christians, worry over the finances. Inflation is real, but why should you worry? Matthew 6.33 is still in the Bible. Philippians 4.19 is still in the Bible. Inflation is real because, as someone said, the grocery carts are just the right size today, just big enough to hold a week's pay. But Matthew 6.33 is still in the Bible, and you need to remember that if you do not have faith for finances, that's so basic that you disqualify yourself from service in God's end-time army. Why? Among other reasons, you wouldn't have any time because you're spending all of your time trying to keep from sinking in the sea of doubt and worry over finances. Sickness, the same thing. Some Christians can't get through the day, or the week at least, without aspirins and tranquilizers and drugs, and I'm including charismatics. They worry over symptoms. They worry whether or not they're going to live or die. They worry about their children if they get ill, whether or not they should rush them to the doctor. These are remnants of roots left over from your old denominational days or from your family roots those days. And so you should allow the Word of God, the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God. Remember Ephesians 5, that's how he's going to do it. Allow the Holy Spirit by the Word of God to root out all roots of worry and anxiety. And again, just because you attend faith assembly doesn't mean that you don't worry over finances or symptoms or whatever. But you see, if you don't have your faith in God for total healing, and for providing for your finances, you disqualify yourself in this end time move. All you are is just a spectator sitting out there listening to teaching and to sermons. Because God expects us to have such faith that we'll never be delayed. When the call goes out, this end time armory of forward march, that we don't have to stop and tape up an ankle or go to the closet and get our crutches or rush to the doctor and get a shot or take a pill. God isn't going to have any sick sergeants or lame lieutenants or consumptive captains or maimed majors or groaning generals in his end-time army. Well, let's come to another remnant that God wants to root out, and that's one that you'll recognize as soon as I mention it as belonging not to you but your neighbor, and that is pride. You wouldn't have that. The remnant of pride. Now, we've dealt with pride, I believe, in some of the earlier studies in growth to full stature, but now let's put some finishing touches to those studies. The roots of pride. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul makes the statement that love is not easily provoked. Love is not easily provoked, and yet, let's be honest, you'll find one of the easiest Places to provoke a person is when you touch some root of pride. Oh, wives are good at it, and so are husbands. We're talking about pride of all kinds, of yourself, your children, your occupation, your education, your ability. Ever have anyone tell you that you're not a pretty good worker? for whatever reason. Now the only response you would have is either no response, and that's rare. I'm talking about inwardly and sometimes outwardly, is that the response would be inwardly that you can do the work as good as anyone else, better than your employer or your manager, whoever's criticizing you. And if he thinks he could do it any better, why doesn't he just try it? 
The point is he's touched a sensitive root of pride is what I'm saying. And so how often after we've hung on the cross for years and we think we're dead to anything, nothing can touch us, after we have hung on that cross and watched the Holy Spirit with the Word of God just begin to cut that tree down, remove branch after branch and limb after limb and twig after twig and parts of the tree, he's leveled it down to the ground. Then when somebody touched that root of pride that was still in the ground, what was the response? Oh, a little green shoot of envy or jealousy or pride began to rise up because you took offense. It said there are many types of pride, pride of race, personal pride, don't anyone ask a woman her age, pride of appearance, pride of family, denominational pride, intellectual pride, occupational pride, national pride, and as many names that are in the dictionary. Let's look at some of these roots. Intellectual pride. Now, have you found, as some have, and be honest with yourself, we don't want you to raise your hand, have you found, as some have, that while you will admit that 1 Corinthians 1, verses 18 and following fit you, you're willing to admit that, that you are one of those God calls to salvation, because he said there he calls the foolish the base, the weak, the despised, the nothings. Have you found you're willing to admit that or testify to that yourself and yet find it bothers you and injures your pride if someone calls you foolish? Well, that's what God said he calls. Why should that bother you? Or someone despises you, maybe the whole community or where you work? He says he calls those, the despised. Have you found you're willing to say, I fit that category you're willing to admit it yourself, but you sure don't want anyone else saying that about you. What does old pride think? Well, I'm educated. What are they calling me foolish for? Or I've got a PhD, or I went to college, or I graduated from high school, or I may not have gone to college, but I'm a successful businessman. That ought to prove something. I'm not a dummy. Or I've got a pretty good high IQ, even if I don't know how to do anything. We see all you've done is remove yourself from that category of people that God said he calls and saves. So you better let the Holy Spirit by the word, and we certainly preach it around here, friends. We're faithful to preach it. We have taught and preached on 1 Corinthians 1 in every and from every direction. So let the Holy Spirit by the word root out intellectual pride. Does it bother you? Some people get bothered because they have degrees. When we stress from the pulpit that God isn't interested in your degrees, He isn't interested in my degrees. He's only interested in whether or not you have the right degree, salvation, baptism of the Holy Spirit, believe His Word. Does it bother you to say God isn't interested in your head full of knowledge, your intellect? It doesn't matter how smart you are. There's always somebody that's smarter than you, even in this world. But God is smarter than you are. Intellectual pride. Here's another kind of pride. Pride of, you never would have figured this one out, ancestry. You mean people are proud of their ancestry, of their race? You better believe it, friends. That's all you hear, pride of race. I thought in America we were just all Americans, but you know what? I'm always hearing about these minorities wanting their rights and wanting to be recognized, whether they're Polish or German or Latinos, just whatever you're hearing if you're doing any reading and listening, you're hearing a constant rumble in America. And I say to my wife, not infrequently, I thought we were just Americans here. Now, it's the end thing, for example, to be a member of a third world country because the UN has favored them, the liberals in government. You know what I'm talking about, or do I have to explain? That the third world nations now are getting all of the attention, so it's in to be a member of a third world nation. I didn't know there was such a thing. Third world. I thought it was one world. <laughs> and when... John F. Kennedy was president, it was in to be Irish. 
And people still to this hour almost worship the man. And now it's in to be Polish because the Catholics have a Polish Pope. And the media is always making big to do about the Pope. Or people say, well, I'm from England and my ancestors are the ones that settled the colonies. And that's true for the most part. But that's a useless kind of prideful boasting that God wants to root out of your system. You're not a German-American or an English-American. By the way, you never hear the English saying, we want to be recognized and favored, that is, English-Americans. You never hear from them. It's always people that are in other minorities. The English are in minority here, even though they colonized early America. But that's a useless kind of prideful boasting because there's always somebody that can top you in their boasting about pride of race. Here's one. My ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Well, that's nothing. Mine were here to greet yours, says the Indian, <laughs> the American Indian. And yet the Indians are put down. But they were here first to greet your ancestors on the Mayflower. Here's one man. My ancestors wrote down the Declaration of Independence, a Virginian boasted. Indeed, replied the Jew, one of my ancestors wrote down the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so there's always someone can top you. Now that may not be a big thing in faith assembly, but it's one of the roots that you need to deal with. That you should not be proud of your ancestry, or who you're related to, or who you descended from. Now, I'm going to tell you something you didn't know, and proof that I'm not proud of it is you didn't know until I just now told you. I descend from one of the presidents of the United States, President Buchanan, on my mother's side. And my very name proves that in England my ancestors were of the free class, not servants and slaves, because they were called free men. That's literally true. But you see, the fact that that's not something for me to be proud of, as you didn't know it until I just told you. So I don't make my boast in that. I make my boast in the fact that the Father in heaven is my God, or God is my Father, that I'm a son of God and a joint heir of Jesus Christ. And if you can make your boast in that, and what Peter said in 2 Peter 1, 4, that we are partakers of the divine nature, if you can make your boast in that, and if you have that, pedigree, that's better than being related or descended from presidents or statesmen or kings or those in authority or discoverers of continents who always boast that they discovered this or that. They didn't discover a continent. God who created it is our father and he knew where he put it all along. It wasn't lost. <laughs> Columbus always gets credit for discovering what Christ created and he knew where he put it. People say, well, I was on the boat with Columbus, or my ancestors were, and whatever. <laughs> so you better get rid of that root of pride if it's in your heart. Now, if you're like all the people that I hear about and read about, then you've got that root of pride that you have to deal with. I don't care if you're Swedish or whatever. You're just an American, and better than that, if you're in Christ, you're just a Christian. Amen. Amen. If people wanted to boast, why boast of their sonship? to God, their Father, who didn't have to discover anything. He made it all. And so as I say, if you don't get rid of that root of pride that I've never heard anyone deal with, so that's why I'm dealing with it, God will send someone along to put you in your place. Pride. This is a true story, too, where a governor, I won't name the state he was governor of, this was the last century when this happened, was at a big affair where he was the center of attention. The waitress in serving the food, they all had a big meal before he gave his speech. The waitress gave him a roll and a pat of butter. Then during the meal, she came back again with a roll but no pat of butter. He said, Miss, he said, I want some more butter. She said, you can't have any more butter. Each person gets one pat of butter. He said, do you know who I am? I'm the governor of this state. She said, do you know who I am? Yes. No, who are you? She said, I'm the waitress in charge of the butter. <laughs> okay. That was an actual occurrence. Governor of a state up east, it wouldn't be around here.
I don't know why, but... <laughs> you see, if you have pride of who you are, God will put you in your place in a hurry. God has ways. And then there is personal pride. Now, this is seen as a deep-seated root personal pride. While you may not have pride even about your children, your work, your occupation, race, background, whatever, personal pride is something else. Would you say this man had pride? I just was reading an account last night of explorers, Arctic explorers, and I have found that explorers and people who climb mountains first and all of that want recognition. They do that to make a name for themselves. They want to be first up the Matterhorn and first this and that and the other. First to swim the English Channel. Why? To make a name for themselves. Would you say this man has pride? He wrote to someone and said in his early life, and he later discovered some things, he said, I don't want to live without being known beyond a few friends in my hometown. I want to acquire a name that will open doors to culture and prestige everywhere. I want a name that will make me equal to any man that I meet. Would you say he had a problem with personal pride? He does. How about yourself? Now this root of personal pride is seen not just in that way of wanting to make a name for yourself, but hating to admit that you made a mistake. Oh, how people will hedge and twist facts and tell half-truths and white lies. Everything in the world. Go through all sorts of verbal gymnastics just to keep from saying, well, I was wrong. This root of pride is hating to admit you're wrong when your ignorance is exposed, when you made a mistake. There's some people can't even admit it's their fault they made a wrong move on the checkerboard. A dumb move in chess. Well, now the reason I made what appeared to be a dumb move and lost the chess game is because your dog distracted me while I was trying to think. <laughs> pride will not admit it made a mistake or was wrong. No, dear, the wife says. I didn't make an error in judgment when I crashed into that car. It was the other driver's fault. You know how poorly most men drive. Why, the way they drive is enough to drive any woman into a nervous state of distraction. And why is it when someone's ignorance, think of your neighbor so you won't be too embarrassed, <laughs> when someone's ignorance of a subject would be exposed if they told the truth, why is it that they will manufacture all sorts of hedges and dodges and tell white lies and half-truths when it's so simple to just say, I made a mistake. I'm ignorant of that fact. Or no, I don't know that individual. Now that's a good one there. Why is it people are always saying when they're talking to you in conversation, do you know brother or sister or Mr. So-and-so? What has that got to do with the story? People are always asking me that. I say, just go on. Go on, tell me the story. <laughs> what does it matter whether I know them or not? I think that's dumb. Now, I'm not talking about if you need to know who they are for them to tell you what you need to be told, you know. Like, associate pastor may say, do you know Jane Doe in the body? And I'll think and say, well, because so many names. I meet so many people here every service. That sometimes I have to see the face before, oh, yes, yes, I remember. So I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about as she was talking to someone, you know Mr. Holtznicker, of course. <laughs> and instead of just saying, no, I never heard of Mr. Holtznicker, <laughs> people will hedge, shrug their shoulders, or nod their head, and you never know whether they said yes or no. <laughs> because if you say no, it makes you feel so ignorant because they're implying you ought to know them. <laughs> so if you talk to me, please don't ask me if I know my wife. <laughs> yes, I know my wife, but don't give me names. Or you're talking to someone, you're trying to impress them with your intelligence, and people do this. Oh, friends, I've had people in the church try to impress me with their intelligence. 
just doesn't cut any mustard with me. But you're talking to someone, you're trying to impress them with your intelligence, and they say, of course you understand, and uh, I'd like for you to explain certain aspect of Einstein's theory of relativity. You understand it, of course. Instead of just saying, no, I don't even know what you're talking about, they'll hedge and say, well, after all, I graduated from high school, har, har, har. <laughs> Which isn't the truth. You're implying anybody who's been to high school ought to know about Einstein's theory of relativity. And the person doesn't know the difference between Einstein and his theory and the man who invented the yo-yo. <laughs> so anyway, dear friends, personal pride will cause otherwise good Christians to tell lies or to hedge. Just admit you missed it. Well, now the reason that I didn't see those two big flashing red lights and went through it and had this crash is because I got distracted about the, why don't you just say you blew it? <laughs> oh, did I blow it. I went through two red lights, two of them flashing, like the policeman stopped me once. Did you see that stop sign? I said, I'll tell you the honest truth, I don't see it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I never did see a stop sign. I thought I had the right of way. It was like a main highway. Another time in Florida. Oh, <laughs> pulled me over to the curb. You know, he just went through a red light. I said, officer, I'll tell you the honest truth. I know I did, but I was already halfway through it. and was either stop in the middle of the intersection or go on. Well, he said, because you're honest, I won't give you a ticket. That really surprised him that someone admitted they saw the red light and went through it anyway. I'm not in the habit of doing that. That just happens to be a little recall here all of a sudden. Why not say you missed it? Police don't take excuses. And then some of the men who are so proud that they try to cover up their baldness with toupees are no different than women, that it's a major offense to suggest that they're over 39. Why are women that way? Same reason men try to hide things, have built-in shoulders in their suits, wear shoe lifts because they're too short. There's a certain amount of pride that we all need to get rid of. But why is it women? It's a major offense. Some people say women can't keep a secret. Oh no? Ask them their age. You hear it all the time. Well, personal pride, here's some more pride. There's pride in regard to one's humility. Now that may sound like a contradiction, but proud that you're humble, pride of humility. Here's a woman who let all the other women at the tea do the talking. She let them monopolize the conversation, didn't offer her opinion even on the most insignificant matters when she was asked. She didn't say a word, but that night in her diary she wrote, Dear Diary, unlike my opinionated, noisy, talkative friends, I'm so glad I've learned not to cast my pearls before swine. <laughs> Our denominational pride sometimes is passed off as humility. I read this somewhere. A group of women gathered together. Baptist woman was leading various denominations. She was leading the meeting. So she said to all of her guests, when it comes to dignity in the services, you Episcopalians rate the highest. When it comes to liturgical ritual, we Baptists can't compare with the Lutherans. And as to methodology, you Methodists are the best. In regard to spirited singing, you Pentecostals have us all beat. But when it comes to humility, we Baptists are the greatest. <laughs> if you've never been a Baptist, you can't appreciate that like we former Baptists. We Baptists were the greatest of everything, even in humility. We have to be careful. I'm saying we don't have to repent of our pride of being humble. So I was going back through the Bible again. I got over to Exodus. I'm reading it through again. And I see how that man's pride causes him to blame others. He won't blame himself. Personal pride 
lack of humility. And you see there in the account in Genesis how when God said to Adam, why did you disobey me? He blamed Eve. When he said to Eve, why did you disobey? She blamed the serpent. And then as I got over into Exodus 32, remember where we read of how Moses went into the mount to get the Ten Commandments and the law. He was gone 40 days. They said, of this man Moses, we don't know what's happened to him. They said to Aaron, the high priest, make us gods that we can worship. Gods had brought us out of Egypt. Of course, calf worship came out of Egypt. So he said, bring all of your earrings and your gold and so forth, and I'll make you a god. And so, you know, he made the golden calf. He melted it down and made the golden calf. Then when Moses came down, broke the Ten Commandments in his anger because of their sin and idolatry, he said to Aaron, why did you do this? And listen to Aaron's reply. He's not going to take the blame. He said, well, they gave me all the gold. I cast it into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> and I had never noticed that before. Out came this calf, you know, like it just popped out of the fire. And he didn't have anything to do with it. I just threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. Then I was listening to the radio, as sometimes I do as I eat, and there was this singing group, religious singing group, that had just won an award. And so the leader of the group, he said, of the award, he said, we're proud we won in a humble Christian sort of way, of course. Now, how can you be humble in your pride? Well, do you know what to do when you're tempted to boast of your achievements or your ancestry or whatever? Well, let me tell you what to do. Okay, that was 10 seconds. Observe 10 seconds silence. And then if the temptation is still there, Observe 10 seconds more. And keep doing that until, well, people leave because they're bored waiting on you to say something, or you get over the temptation. That's true, friends, when you're tempted to boast. Now, no one outside my wife and my immediate family knows that I descend from a president. How many of you knew that? Aren't you proud? You're a pastor. Why didn't you tell us, pastor? So we could tell others that you're not some kook. <laughs> Regardless of all this slander by the media and all, they think he's crazy. He descends from President Buckhannon. Well, friends, there's no temptation to pride there because, and I don't say this to be derogatory, but if you read of his accomplishments, there just wasn't a whole lot. But that isn't his fault. It was in an era when there wasn't much to accomplish. <laughs> Didn't need a new deal or a fair deal or a new frontier to develop, to spend the people's money. There was no income tax in those days. You got to keep all you earned, no draft. So there wasn't a lot to do, you know. So there's not a lot of history about my ancestor. But praise the Lord, if I wanted to boast, I wouldn't have told you that, would I? Well, praise God. Father, in Jesus' name, as you begin your finishing touches in our lives, in these areas we've suggested as well as many others, oh, grant grace to all of your people. May they seek your grace to submit to your finishing work. Because after having suffered on the cross, it isn't human nature to want the legs to be broken and the spear to be thrust in the side to see if the person is dead. But, Father, we know it's necessary to have the finishing work done in us by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. So wash us clean of every spot and wrinkle and blemish that in everything we will be in the image of thy Son and all of his holiness, perfection. 
of whom the scriptures say he was without spot or blemish, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.